I would coach and I worked with women to help them to boost their confidence and help them to be more visible on social media. So, on my book, Be a Number One Cheerleader, <laughs> which was recently published, uh, takes the, the journey of the entrepreneurial um, story and helps you to kind of use some of my own personal stories to uh, understand how to be more optimistic, um, positive, fight fear, and, um, you know, get accustomed to growth mindset. So, without further ado, let's get chatting with Laura. Laura, how are you? <laughs> I am good, thank you. Yeah, I'm just going to apologise in advance if I get slightly interrupted by a small child, but we should be okay. Okay, no worries at all. We have had children in the background, we've had cats, so we're good. <laughs> uh, very inclusive. Um, so let me get started with my first question, and that's really asking you a bit about your background. So I mean, what's your story? You know, tell us a bit about what you do, uh, what do you do, and why do you do it? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. So I'm called Laura and I am a change coach. So I help working mums in particular to find the headspace and the time to figure out what their next steps are going to be, whether that's at work or in life. And together we kind of go on a journey of exploration to understand what it is that's holding them back from being able to make that change. So that's what I've been doing self-employed wise for about the last three or four months um, prior to that I was a coach and I was working internally at a tour operator and with COVID and with the pandemic I was on furlough and then I was um, well I took voluntary redundancy actually and I decided to launch my own business um, and do the coaching thing independently so that's a very short history of what I did and what I'm now doing um, I'm sure there's lots more will come out as we chat tonight. Absolutely wow that's a great summary so there's lots of books for us to dig into um, in a little bit so um, tell us a bit more about your um, experience um, you know in your former career um, and how has it been as a woman like trying to progress um, and what challenges have you overcome? Yeah it's a good question and I think it's something that I talk to a lot with my clients because it, it comes up often and what I feel is that I'm on a bit of a mission to kind of help mums to to step away from that stereotype of what happens once we have children which is we often end up going back to a job that we like that we can get paid for that we're pretty good at but doesn't necessarily fulfill us and I was definitely in that position so before I had my children I was um, a manager I was managing a team and then I went back the first time still as a manager but in a slightly different role than part-time but then the second time I went back I had to go back even more part-time and I wasn't able to stay in a management role at that time and so I had to adapt to that and I had to learn to enjoy the job I was doing and find good stuff in it which was plenty but I had something more within me and I knew that I wanted to develop and grow and so for me it was having the courage to identify what it was I wanted which was to become a qualified coach I'd been doing it informally at work and then to ask for support for that from my company and so I had to be very brave and go and speak to the HR director and say this is what I want to do I think that you should help me with it and tell me what you think and they did they paid for the qualification they supported me through it and then I started being able to coach as part of my role so I think I was held back but then I took the opportunity and I took the courage to do that and it's really paid off and I've been so grateful to have had the opportunity and that's led me to where I am now so I know firsthand what it's like to be able to see what you've got on what what's on your plate but to think about what else there is out there and to then make the leap into the unknown. Mm, mm, amazing so you've already talked a little bit about your own um, journey with um, the learning development within your company and I was wondering if you could give us some like advice and tips for other women out, out there who don't feel perhaps as uh, bold as as courageous as you um about um some questions that they can ask for you know getting the right opportunities um and really like knowing how that they can um you know bargain for the best um things that are available to them and not just be satisfied with an initial offering or um you know things that don't really like actually help them to progress as they would want to yeah I think it's really important that we start to recognize what our strengths are and how we can use those and I think for me I did that through having coaching of my own and going through the qualification and learning about recognizing what your strengths are and there's lots of tools and you know coaches can really help in this instance because there's loads of advice and 
and um, things you can read on the internet but once you start going into it more deeply with a coach then you start to unlock your own potential I think that's what's really key is is recognizing your potential and then finding the bravery to to ask for things and to to be more assertive and to not accept the status quo anymore and I think that is happening a lot more and women are becoming more confident to be able to do that and companies are becoming more flexible and much more open to alternatives to the nine to five or nine to ten on you know whatever the, the daily grind looks like I think there is a gradual shift towards more flexibility and it's just something that we need to keep on pushing so that more employers see that there are there is such potential in this in this workforce in this demographic but that it's not being recognized or supported enough and that you know it's time to think outside the box I think COVID has shown us that we can work from home work flexibly people can manage and actually it's a really good turning point to come out of all of the not so good stuff yeah no I absolutely um uh, agree uh, with you totally 100% um, and so you've already talked a bit, bit about, you know, how you have started your thoughts about, you know, what you wanted to do and, and as Kevin, you know, hit and you decided to, um, you know, do the, the career change that you have done. Can you mm. give us some tips on, you know, how people can, you know, get the courage to think, well, actually, you know, I do think there's something else that I want to be doing, but I'm not really sure how to approach, like, one, figuring that out or two, you know, making um, a plan or taking steps to actually um, be able to move forward else that I really want to do yeah I think it's really good to work out what it is that drives you and so using any kind of tool to do that so personally I use something called ikigai which is a Japanese thing which is about the life and it helps you to identify what you love what you can be paid for what you're good at and what the world needs and when you have all of those things ticked or you can identify all of those things for you then you can kind of find your sweet spot. You can find what, what really lights up your soul, your purpose and passion, and that is really connecting with you on a kind of bigger picture. And so once you know that, it makes making choices about your next step a lot easier because you know it's aligned to your values or to your beliefs. And so you can be more confident in choosing more exciting things or more challenging things because you know it's going to work for you. And we always get stuck in logistics and roadblocks and the reasons why we can't do things. But I think to start off with, it's good to have that much bigger picture thinking and really kind of expand it out and then start to narrow it down to what actually practically you can do to start making changes and to start moving towards that next thing or that next goal. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely fantastic advice there. And you already told us that you have kids of your own. So let's talk about the motherhood experience and what is that like like balancing a motherhood and a career what advice would you give oh sorry i'm here still <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's all right we were just uh, getting to motherhood i was like oh, don't don't leave me yet <laughs> can't be that bad okay <laughs> yeah no so tell, give some tips about um motherhood uh, and balancing your career um and that's yeah, so um, so my boys are seven, seven and five, um, so they're at primary school, which has been, well, it's been a bit of a funny year, obviously, but now they're both at school, and so that's given me a different type of working experience, so now I work, you know, every day, but I work within school hours, um, and that feels quite flexible to me, and it feels quite achievable. Before that, we were doing the commute, we were doing, you know, nursery and after school club and breakfast club and and trying to manage all of the different components and I think I had taken on a lot more so I was only working three days a week before COVID and my husband was working full time so I was taking on all of the extra responsibilities but since COVID and my husband's been working at home a lot more and I've now moved into this new role and this new staff employment that dynamic has had to adjust more because we're both have different demands and so I think my journey of working motherhood's been a bit of a roller coaster it's been quite it was quite traditional at the beginning you know working part-time doing all the childcare, and now I feel like it's changed and it's moving in a direction which I feel much more fulfilled by and I I feel like because I'm happy and satisfied and content in what I'm doing that's really helpful for the whole family and I think we're all benefiting from that that new way of living and, and being Really brilliant. One question I just want to add because we're already like talking about this area is, um, you know, how do you feel that, um, you know, working families can like balance 
um, you know, the home being both the workplace and the place that everyone has <laughs> entitlement to. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't think I have the answer. It's, it's really difficult. And I think it's about being kind of patient and compassionate with each other and an understanding that we are all on top of each other. And, you know, it's okay that the kids come in and interrupt and it's okay that you, you, you're kind of scrapping about with different hours and you may have to do a bit here and a bit. Oh, I'm having oh, practical nightmares today. Sorry. We're there, we're there. I'm excited. I'm like, <laughs> I know. <"Whoa." laughs> Sorry. Um, I think it's just accepting that things have changed and that's the workplace it's, is much more integrated with home now and seeing the positives in that. So for us, it's been not having a commute, which is amazing. And the fact that my husband has been able to be around for bedtimes and meals so much more than he ever was because his, his hours were much longer and there was the commute. So I think it's seeing the positives in that and just trying to adjust as best you can. And, and I think what I've learned this year is you can just have to roll with whatever comes your way. So we've just got the kids back to school and my oldest son was off for two weeks because there was a, a case in his bubble yeah. and he couldn't go to school it's like oh no we've just got sorted yeah. now we've got to homeschool again and so it's just that bit of give and take and I think employers are much more flexible to that as well so my husband was doing that homeschooling bit as well and you know his employer had to understand that he can't can't do everything so yeah it's that flexibility I think oh amazing Right, let's get into a bit more about, well, now we're talking about, you know, working from home uh, and being in the home environment um, and the fact that it's um, really been, um, I guess, a leveler um, and it shows people can be productive anywhere, not just at just the office. So, yeah. you know, I was wondering as a working mum and someone who has been in both environments, you know, how do you feel that women can um, demonstrate their, their, product their productivity and their, their outputs um, and also use this to negotiate when they're trying to like get good contracts um, for leadership roles? yeah I think it's a really difficult question and I think that sometimes as society we are quite focused on output and achievement and results and the pressure of that can be quite huge and I know we'll talk about your book in a little bit but the, the section on burnout was really important for me because it's that idea that we have to be proving ourselves all the time proving that we're good enough proving that we're enough proving that you know we are capable and actually I think if employers can recognize the input side a bit more so skill set and you know communication skills all the leadership role stuff so all of that soft stuff I suppose if they can see that and, and have that demonstrated in either an interview format or a you know on the job format I think that's a much better way of, of proving someone's worth because that will lead to the results and that will lead to the output and you know I think women and working women uh, working mums in particular are completely the most productive people that I know and you know I was doing a job share before and there was two of us and we were doing so much more work because we were just so efficient but it is hard to prove that without saying these are my tangible results but I think if you are going to be doing something that is a tangible goal then you know, being really clear on what your goals are in the first place is a great way to start because then you can look at those goals and you can go back over them and say, were they achieved or not? And the accountability is there. So perhaps if there is an output needed, it's around your own personal goals and the goals of the company and, and sort of working towards those in a way that feels good and, and fulfilling for you. Yeah, no, no, I agree. And I agree with you. Like some, some of the most um, productive people that I know are working women who do so much do so, much, do so much but are, are not recognized for that because it's just taken for granted and it's kind of ironic that when they feel guilty about you know picking up their kids or taking time to watch the school, school play um they've really put in like 110 more hours um so I really feel yeah. that they should recognize that and speak up um and yeah. actually um negotiate and bargain and say well you know I can demonstrate my um you know output by x y and z I don't actually have to yeah. be like you know seen everywhere or every minute of the day um, if I'm actually getting the work done yeah and it's a trust thing isn't it it's that yeah. whole idea of you've got to pr be presenting and you've got to be at work and it's actually if they if they trust you and your employer trusts you then it shouldn't matter you shouldn't have to prove yourself because it's just implicit and you are giving the results and you are delivering in spite of or because of all the other stuff you've got going on you're still able to do that in and so I think yeah trust both ways is really key yeah 
No, I agree. And that leads me on to the next question, which is about resilience. So <laughs> what does resilience mean to you? And how have you been like um, practicing that as you've been getting on in these uh, COVID times? Yeah, COVID times. Yeah, so I think for me, I the, the best thing I've ever learned on resilience is from a TED talk, which hmm. is where I learn a lot of things, um, where a lady, uh, well, I don't even know what her name is now, it's terrible, but she was already a specialist in resilience. Okay. That, uh, field of of research and then she had a really tragic thing happen in her life and she had to actually then be resilient because you know she just kind of learned it rather than lived it and, and one of her tips is to recognize in a situation if what you're doing is helpful or harmful and it's really simple concept but in order to become resilient you don't always have to be for me living in the pain and, and living in that kind of mm. the, the bad stuff if that is not helpful then you can leave it aside and you can move on so if it's harmful if it's helpful then great carry on with it but the the helpful harmful thing has, has really been good for me so I for example don't necessarily always read all of the news or watch things that I know are going to upset me and for me that's how I stay a bit more resilient is because I can't I can't process all of that and so I'm like okay that doesn't help me so I'm going to do something else that is much more helpful and it's going to keep me kind of buoyant and strong and recognizing that that is what works for me mm, no I think that's a good process and also I guess having that self-awareness to know that yeah. that triggers you <laughs> so perhaps Definitely. not the best thing to be to be doing and not just keep on on, on the same circus uh yeah. sometimes it's just really hard to get off there you're like well, well actually I can stop doing that <laughs> yeah exactly and that's the thing is that you know we kind of live by an unspoken set of rules and it's like okay well no I don't have to do that I don't I don't have to for example mum guilt is is one of the biggest themes that yeah. comes up with clients and it's like no 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 it's not just part of motherhood you do not have to feel that way and you can change you can change any of these things you can change your mindset you can change the way you think about a situation and you can change your reactions so that is what makes you more resilient is the ability to as you say have that self-awareness definitely definitely now let us move on to the question of the hour what does the inner critic mean to you <laughs> yeah. the inner critic is is strong I think it is strong with me and I have learned to have a lot of conversations with the inner critic whose name in my case is Barbara so no offense for any Barbara's out there <laughs> it's not a particular Barbara it's referencing it just popped into my head um and I actually was having a conversation with my own coach recently mm. about the inner critic and I said no I'm I'm, I'm much better at um recognizing when it's my inner critic telling me mm. you know you're not good enough or you should be doing this or you know what right have you got to be attempting any of yeah. this um and I'm good at like putting it aside and moving on and she said okay well I think you're just putting it into time out you're not actually oh. dealing with it and I was like yeah. Ooh. And she said how would it feel to just not ever have that conversation anymore not have your inner critic at all and I was like oh so it was a really interesting point because I felt like we are quite well I'm getting I'm personally getting a lot better at saying I can say put to one side I, you know I appreciate it's there but I'm moving forward and I understand that the inner critic for me has been a kind of protection mechanism mm, mm. protecting me from the big scary putting yourself out there big wide world being visible all of that stuff that we're kind of taught to not want or not do and so I get that and I'm grateful for it but also sometimes I think the inner critic for me allows me to hold myself back and, and I'm like oh I just you know it's okay I don't need to put myself out there and I can use it as a bit of an excuse so actually the thought of just being like no nah, don't have that anymore is quite wild it's quite crazy for me so I'm still working on it but it is an interesting concept to think about think about not just not having it and that there may be people in the world that just don't have an inner critic I can't imagine I can't imagine it for, for a second <laughs> but I'm sure that it, it exists I don't know I mean what do you I mean you are yeah, well, feel. what do you think? No, I think that everyone has some kind of voice that quite well. I mean, apart from the people who are just, you know, the Donald Trump, maybe. He has well, one. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, that, that's true. That's true. Um, yeah, I, I think that for the majority of people, there is a little voice that sometimes, you know, comes out, as you say, and it feels protective, but then you have to question, is that really protective? Um, and should I actually be listening to it uh, and actually reason with it um, and think about actually how you're going to take steps to actually one either 
squish it down or to remove it entirely as your coach said mm -hmm. um and i think those are all valid ways to go i don't think there's necessarily a particular way that you should go for i think you should go for a way that actually works and helps you to yeah. actually keep it in check definitely absolutely um, so what i was actually going to move on to ask is you know did Apart from your coach, do you have any other resources or, or tips around like resources that people can use to like manage their inner critic? Yeah, so I have my three top books, which I recommend to everybody. Well, four, because like, obviously yours too. <laughs> um, so my other ones are Playing Big by Tara Moore, which um, was the first book I really read that covered inner critic and also the opposite of that, your inner mentor. So listening to tuning into that as well as that, I'm doing kind of angel and devil. So that book was really transformational for me and I, it, it kind of changed my life. So I would recommend it to everybody. Then um, Untamed by Glennon Doyle. Again, it's just such a revelation to be presented with things that are so different to how society expects us to think and, and which feed the inner critic. And so she has written this book, which is just a, not about doing that. It's about connecting with your kind of deeper inner knowing of yourself and trusting that more which I love. And then the other one is um, a book called um, How to Be a Badass, and that's by Jen Sincero. And that is, again, another really great book that kind of just takes your worries and your fears and your self-doubt and turns on its head and just kind of keeps reminding you that you, you can do it, you're great. It's really full of like very positive affirmations. So it's quite, it's quite full on, but it's a really good one to pep you up and make you feel like great about yourself. Really? Well, I just want to, actually, I want to ask about the, the first thing you mentioned and about the inner mentor. Can you tell us a bit more about that? That sounds quite interesting. Yeah, it's really interesting. So in the book, she, she talks about the inner critic and the kind of harm that it does and what, why it's there. And then she says, we also have an inner mentor. And she describes a kind of visual, visualization exercise where you connect with that person. And it's, it's, it's a version of yourself, but it's the voice that, again, it's that knowing and it's listening to what you, it's almost like what would your future self say to you now or a version of yourself where you don't have these worries and concerns and what would they be saying about you and it's sort of tuning in to listen to what your strengths are admitting your strengths and not just always talking about your weaknesses and 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 where can you go with those things and those discoveries where can that inner mentorship lead you and so it's about not always listening to the inner critic or listening to it but then also going okay so what would my in a mentor say so it's that really kind of mindful way of connecting with a more kind and positive and compassionate version of yourself mm, no I, I was interested to hear more about that because i think that a lot of people might say they would struggle to hear yeah. their intervent their in, in a mentor um and so they might be more comfortable with thinking about w what i say to a friend or if it wasn't me yeah. what i'd be saying to encourage myself to yeah. or that person who was not me to actually take the action or to, to do what I'm afraid to do. Um, yeah. So I was curious to, to see how she was going to sort of um, bring that notion to life to help us to actually, you know, get to a point where we're embracing that. We know that we have things that we're able and capable to do, but mm -hmm. some of us can't hear those things. Some of, some of us is drowned out by all the other things we're yeah. trying to grapple with. <laughs> Exactly. I think that's why the visualization is really strong because it really makes you connect. And I use visualization a lot in coaching sessions with my clients to get them to really step into what it is they want to achieve, you know, like on, on, on all their senses and, and you know, all of it becomes quite real and quite a strong connection. And so the, the, the visualization in this book just does that for you. And I think it was really effective for me. Yeah, I think we should all take a check on out. I think that I'd like to read that too. <laughs> this book to everybody, it's it's seriously life changing. Oh, amazing. Okay, great. So talking of books, you have read the book. Yay! <laughs> yeah, well so, done. It's so, thank it's, you. And it's really it's the thing I really like about it is that it's obviously really well written and it covers so many topics. But then you've got all the kind of notes and the journaling and the, the thoughts and the activities which make it just like very practical and hands-on which I think is just a nice way to have done a to do, to do a resource like this it's really engaging yeah no I wanted to do a book that was active and not passive in it and gave you the opportunity to like engage and like write their thoughts and try to think about how they can learn from what I've said but also um reflect on the questions that are posed to hopefully help them to take a more active uh, and um, move to more uh, more optimistic um mindset so I mean in terms of the conversation that we're having today do you think is there anything um in the book that would help people to kind of tackle their inner critic I mean all of it obviously it's great <laughs> 
for me, one of, one of the things I focus on a lot in my work is the idea of asking for help, which you know, you've got a whole mm, chapter on yeah. how hard that is. And one of my kind of mantras is that asking for help is a strength, not a weakness. Yes. And so I think your book really speaks to that. And it's, you know, it's, it's okay to ask for help. And these are the ways that you can do it. And this is how it will help you. I think it's just such a useful thing to be reminded of. It's, you know, it's totally fine. You're not being a burden. You're not making anyone else's life more difficult by asking for help. And, and I personally have found it really hard to ask for help over the years and to admit that I'm finding things hard or I haven't got it all under control, God forbid. And so to be able to kind of really work out why, where you need help and then go and ask for it and find the resources it's just such an empowering thing to be able to do so it's I was really glad that you'd written a whole chapter on that yeah no as one of the things um which I felt was really important to say to people because I think it's often one of those things where people are just very reluctant um and they just have a lot of like fear uh and and like doubt and like that whole like you know confidence piece that they, they think that by by doing it they're letting themselves down but what I want to like remind them that, that they're actually not they're actually putting themselves in a position of strength so that they don't have to like carry the burden alone and actually people do generally want to help you but you just need to make sure that you're you know trying to ask in the right way um and that you you do a little bit of, of helping yourself before you you ask for that help because it, there are many things that we can do but it's just sometimes we get panicked and, over, and overwhelmed um yeah. so i just thought it would be helpful to, to provide a few like um tips um mm. and, and insights to help people to kind of like have, have a moment to um process that yes you should do it um, and to um think about ways that might be able to, to help them to go forward with it because i think it's just such a powerful thing like when you like um embrace it you know you just feel lighter uh and it just it's just so um helpful because you know that you don't have to like be in your own like um prison of your mind um and that actually um you know you can move forward um and in doing so you're actually helping everyone to move forward because you know when you're struggling by yourself you're not actually going to be, be productive so it's not really helping yeah. any no exactly that exactly that. It's, you know you're it's been kind of counterproductive isn't it you should just ask for help <laughs> yes for sure for sure so in in that um i guess we're talking in this sort of like motivation and like asking for help what keeps you like motivated when things are tough and things are like you know feeling a bit you know i guess overwhelming for you yeah yeah and that definitely happens i think what keeps me motivated is to keep connecting with what it is I'm trying to achieve. So I kind of, you know, the, the bigger picture and the mission that I'm on to get more working mums to, to step off the treadmill and to, to try something different and to, to be brave. And so that motivation keeps me going. And just, I think the motivation that I have made this choice to change, to be in a role that is not typical employment anymore. And I knew that it was gonna to get tough and I knew that there was gonna be ups and downs and just realizing that those are temporary and that if I keep, on in the same way and keep being consistent then it will you know it will feel better and the next day will be different and I think it's just that kind of idea that this feeling doesn't stick around forever and it's oh I am still here <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't stick around forever um also exercise motivates me so if I if I'm feeling a bit stressed out then I do yoga or go for a little run and we'll do a little workout of some sort and that really helps to lift whatever cloud is I'm under so it's just that for me exercise is really all for my mind more than anything so that just helps me to to get back on track motivation wise oh amazing and I guess just one final question because we, we like to talk about the entrepreneurial journey um as you are someone who's just recently um joined um that um community like how do you feel about you know um having patience with, you, with yourself with the, your goals and the, the things that you're working towards like how do you keep yourself like you know going for it even sometimes when you know things are a bit slow or things don't like land as you expect <laughs> yeah it's hard and and you know it's something that I've had to work on and I'm still working on loads is the I have this intrinsic need for external validation which is loads of just like words isn't it but essentially if someone tells me I'm doing a good job then I'm like a little flower like oh thank you thank you um so I've had to learn that I don't really have that anymore unless I'm you know I suppose social media likes and comments yes, and stuff I yeah. try not to get too attached to that but you know, there isn't a manager or a boss or an appraisal mm. and so it's like okay I have to do that for myself now and I have to recognize what I've done well and 
take the emotion out of it as well so if I I don't know do a post on Instagram and it doesn't really land then it's like okay fine that's not a it's not a reflection I'm not a bad yeah. person I didn't do something wrong I haven't hurt anybody mm. I'm just gonna move on yeah and so trying to detach a little bit from the kind of emotional side of any of that needing to be liked and adored and all of that nonsense that we that we carry with us no, that's a good tip because I think that often that people um, don't realize that it does take a lot of time and effort to like, you know, build a following or to have people engage with you or for people to even like, you know, know that you're there because there's yeah. such a vast social media like uh, yeah. community that you are but one little pin okay. who's, keep, who's out there trying to like, you know, yeah. share your stuff and get people to like be interested. Um, and and yeah. I just feel like the people need to know that it takes time. Um, and one post isn't going to do it. So you have to be persistent and you've got to be, going. yeah, got to keep going. Um, yeah. And you, you also, just... for me, there was this realization that I see every single thing I put out on social media. <laughs> I see every post that nobody else does. And I think I forget that. I'm like, oh God, I've posted all this stuff. And why isn't anybody seeing it? It's like only I am seeing everything. Not even my mum and dad see. No, they don't care. My husband doesn't care. Like, so it's just, you know, you're not as much you're not as visible as you think you are I think is also important to know so that's why you've got to be consistent definitely definitely and the other thing I was just going to say to, to everyone else out there is you know as we're talking about asking for help you know ask for help and if you have a particularly important post ask for your friends or people that you know to just do a friendly like or a comment you know it's, it's not always organic people like it really yeah. isn't <laughs> they should be supporting you so get yeah get hitting, hit those comments up for sure, for sure. So yeah, I just wanted to um, round it up by saying thank you so much, but I wanted to check with you if you've got anything that you want coming up that you'd like to share with us um, before then. Um, I'm doing a little workshop tomorrow, very short notice, um, one o'clock on Zoom uh, for about Ikigai, which is what I spoke about at the very beginning, okay. which is about finding your why and your purpose and passion. Um, you can just find me on it. Instagram and I can send you the link if that is something you're interested in and other than that it's just one-to-one -one coaching so that's what I do most of and I work with working mums on a one-to-one -one basis and I take them through whatever it is they're looking to change and whatever they are hoping to see different in their life um, and now is the time so I don't want them to wait any longer I think that now is their time. Brilliant and just to remind us um, how can we get in touch with you on your socials? So I'm at that balanced life coach on everything. So that's the best place to find me. Amazing. Okay. Well, thank you, Laura. Thank you so much. It's been a really like fun interview. Um, we've had a lot of <laughs> laughs uh, <laughs> and we shared lots of good advice. So I can't wait for everyone to catch this on the replay. Um, yes. Well, you take care and we'll speak again soon. Speak again soon. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. thank you for having me. <laughs> Don't worry. Take care. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Yeah.